people reach for EQs way too soon. It's more like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Start from the beginning point. Don't start from the end point. Essentially, you have the room, then you have the singer, then you have the microphone. Uh, then you have the cable, the preamp, let's say you're using one compressor, and then you have the interface, then you have the computer, and then you have the plugin. So the plugin is uh, ninth in the chain. So why would you reach for the ninth thing in the chain? Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Today's episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is sponsored by Roswell Pro Audio, maker of handcrafted microphones in California. Inspired design and impeccable attention to detail will help you capture a gorgeous vintage sound without the vintage price tag. Check out their beautiful line of microphones at roswellproaudio.com. Sending your music to be mastered can be scary, but sending your music to a total stranger for mastering can be really scary. Chris Graham is a billboard chart breaking mastering engineer with thousands of credits and knows how to make your record sound fantastic. But more importantly, he understands that there is one person that really knows what a great record sounds like, and that's you, rock stars. So if you're thinking about hiring professional mastering, but not sure if it's right for you, go to chrisgrammastering.com and get a free sample mastering of your song. Go find out just how great your record can sound at chrisgrammastering.com. Just click the link included in the show notes. Hey, rock stars. It's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Lior Goldenberg, a producer and mixer based in Los Angeles. He's been making records in LA since the early 90s, starting out as a runner at the record plant and then as a second engineer for producers like Rick Rubin, Michael Beinhorn, Robert Margulef, and Manny Merican. Lior's clients include Stone Temple Pilots, Ziggy Marley, Rancid, Fuel, Macy Gray, Cheryl Crow, Vanessa Carlton, Marilyn Manson, Andrew W.K., Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, Alanis Morissette, MXPX, Alan Stone, and many, many more. He has even mixed songs for Michael Jackson and Stevie Wonder, and he recently produced and mixed a record for Grant Ganser, a finalist on The Voice. Lior has worked at Conway Studios and Scream Studios before going completely independent at his Calabasas facility in 2006, and he's currently building a studio in Woodland Hills. Um, so here's a quote from Lior. This is his, his uh, self-appointed mission for music. Quote, beyond all the vintage gear and te- technical expertise and experience I offer is a truly immersive experience like a boot camp, where I talk to my clients about everything from eating habits to meditation to connecting to the place from which they wrote the song and bringing that pain, frustration, and love to their performance in the studio. I think it's important for me to be flexible, adapting to the project's specific emotional and sonic needs. It's not just about recording sounds, but providing a safe and magical space. My job is to bring out the best in artists and, whenever necessary, push them out of their comfort zone. That's a great quote, man. I love that. Please oh, welcome. Thank you. Thank Le- you. Yeah. Please welcome Lior Goldenberg to Recording Studio Rockstars. Lior, are you ready to rock, man? I am ready to rock. Thank you for having me on the show. My pleasure, dude. Um, you know, reading your quote and then also some of the producers you work with, one of the connections, well, a couple of connections. I mean, I, I sort of make a connection to. Rick Rubin, when I think about meditation, because I think sure. he's always been big into transcendental meditation or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Or at yeah. Least, you know, these are all stories I hear through the grapevine, for example. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know, you know, which philosophy Rick subscribes to as far as his specific uh, technique in meditation. But, um, you know, I've, I've practiced transcendental meditation and it really, really helps me in, uh, you know, again, that thing of c- connecting to the place from which we started pursuing me making music whatever it is if you're a, an instrumentalist or a singer a producer a you know a dj whatever it is but but the place of creating art um 
is really a place from the heart. And with all the noise around us these days with technology and, and you know, short attention spans, it's really important to reconnect yourself to that place, I think, every day and remind yourself why you're creating art. And, um, I, you know, so to me, it's, it's doing meditation. Even if I get to a couple times a day uh, and reconnect to the place, it just keeps the creation pure and less, you know, timeline-based or money-based or... Um, you know, whatever demand base. It's just about, Hey, let's make art because we want to, and we need to. Yeah. Um, I haven't had Rick Rubin on the podcast yet, but I look forward to it one day, but I have He's had pretty Mike, incredible. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure he is. And I, I, I've only seen him across the, uh, sort of the, the t basketball court at sunset sure. sound years sure. ago, Yeah, but I have had Michael Beinhorn on. And that was another thing that he really emphasized both in his book and on the podcast. I think he, he gave me the impression that he really likes to get super involved in the artist's, you know, kind of world and creative experience. So I imagine that that might have also been an influence for you. That's absolutely. Over. Michael is a Michael is a great friend of mine uh, and and a mentor and and really a huge influence on a lot of things. And he's reconnected me uh, to again to the source of things. I've, I've I've gone through a stage in the maybe early two thousands where I've taken more kind of money gigs, you know, major label, big artists. And um, and working with artists who weren't connected to their um, art, it was just about, you know, they're expected to put out a record um, and so they needed to. So they were in the studio doing it. It made me question my um, not commitment, but my why am I doing this? And then at some point I said, wait, I. I don't have doubts about why I'm doing this. These people have doubts. I should just not be working with those people. And that's when I really switched to doing a lot of indie stuff. Um, but doing a, a record, a really fantastic record with Michael, which I can't talk about too much. It's not out yet. But, um, oh, cool. it, you know, reconnected me to, we really connect. I think we reconnected each other, which was nice. I, you know, I reminded him why we do this. And he reminded me. And we just, we went into this very immersive um uh, process of, of, of inspiring each other, which was really, really great. He's a, he's a fantastic human being. So, yeah, well, he was great to talk to on the show. And for me, it was having a real hero on the show. Oh yeah. In fact, I'm curious if mechanical animals might've been one of the records you worked with. It, um, it was, I was, I was a second engineer at record plant and that was the first time I worked with Michael. And, um, I, I, I mean, there are no, that record speaks for itself. It's just, sonically incredible you know mm -hmm. performance it's just incredible you 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 even people who aren't so into Marilyn Manson will listen to it and, and be touched by it and that's I think that's the idea or the point of art is is touching people uh, and making them feel and and especially in in the, these days where people feel less and less I think making art that makes people feel is is um you know it's definitely an important goal to have um it definitely you know, touched me. I'm one of those people. So I was working with the band Living Things. Uh, they were a Trixa before that. Mm. And um, it was act actually, it was no, I'm sorry, it was a Trixa. It was before Living Things. And we were working on their record for Hollywood Records. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anything about Marilyn Manson, but these guys were, in, you know, they were the band that was younger than me. They were right. kept introducing me to new artists right. like um, Portishead, you know, I learned mm -hmm. about from, from this guy and, and Marilyn Manson. And it was mechanical animals that really flipped the switch for me, and I got it, and I was like, "Holy shit, this is amazing!" You know, it's incredible. It's almost like a Beatles record, but in I don't know if you can call it metal, but it's it's you know it's almost like a Beatles record. It it every song changes the the kind of where you are, the the atmosphere of where you are, and if you listen to that record, you know, with eyes closed, it it really takes you on a journey, and it's incredible. Yeah, and you guys were breaking new ground. You know, it's that kind of record. It was like new sonic territory for music to go. To my really mind, incredible, you know? really incredible. And seeing Michael uh, interact with his artists and, um, you know, he pushes them, but not in a pushy way. He pushes them to excel and, uh, to, you know, again, to reconnect with, with the feelings uh, from which the songs were written and, uh, and, and career choices were made to, to pursue this avenue rather than, you know, be a day trader or um, whatever, uh, you know, a, a, I like the, a doctor or a fireman, you know. Yeah, I like your, your, our choices are musician, day trader, doctor, or <laughs> fireman. <laughs> I feel like it's either that or you know become like a butt star. So <laughs> it's nice. it's one of those four, absolutely. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, well, so let's jump back a little bit and talk about you know more of that time and stuff. 
tell us more about how you got started in recording and, you know, how did you go from, you know, the beginning of this stuff to being a successful producer that you are today? Well, I, um, I moved from Israel to LA in the mid nineties to go to school. I went to MI Musicians Institute and uh, guitar was my main instrument. And when school was done, I just, I felt like I wasn't ready to go home yet. I, I was really curious about so many things in music. I was, the cool thing about MI is that they have, um, they have different sub schools in the school for, you know, bass and guitar and vocals. And so you really interact with musicians all the time. And then they force you to play in these live playing workshops. So you play with other musicians all the time. And uh, just before I finished, they opened a recording production uh, program, which had a, rec- a really nice recording studio in it with an SSL. And when I, I remember the, I don't know if it was orientation or maybe day one of school, but when I walked into that control room, everything changed for me. I knew that this is what I wanted to do. I knew that I still loved guitar, but but I knew that I, my instrument is will become other musicians. Like that's what I play. I play musicians. I. I mold them and I, I, you know, I push them into performing the best that they can. And that became really my passion is, is making people perform better and, and, and fine tune my capturing skills. So when they are in that moment and they're, they're doing something incredible, I, I, I'm ready to go and I'm doing it. So, well, I dig that. I mean, I felt similarly, um, there are only so many knobs on a guitar and there are a lot more knobs <laughs> on a console and in a Absolutely. studio and there's no blinking lights on most guitars, right? Yes, exactly. I'm not sure. I can't think of any guitars that have blinking lights. I mean, at this point there might be line six might be making <laughs> something, but yeah, you might be right. Yeah. It was incredible. As a guitar player, I had a Strat, uh, I had a Fender amp and I had maybe one, pe- maybe I had two pedals. I might've had, I think I had an, a vintage Vox Wah and, um, maybe some sort of distortion, maybe an, a delay or something. But when I walked in the studio, I just became a gear fiend. I, w- I just wanted to have everything. And I wanted to understand how things work, which with the guitar, I was just like, okay, yeah, strings vibrate, pickup picks it up. I'm good. Like, I don't need to know more than this. But with, with recording gear, I really became obsessed. Uh, and so a lot of my gear is modified where over the years, I, I realized that all the, you know, all the legendary gear, the A&M gear and the Abbey Road gear and the, you know, electric lady gear, all that gear is all modified. Nothing is stock. All this legendary gear that we've, you know, we've heard these stories, the Capitol Studios, um, you know, the 47 and the, they're all heavily modified um, because they were great when they made them. But A, the, you know, the really great gear is old uh, or the majority of great gear is old. And um that gear was, they didn't have gear companies back then. You know, it, a studio needed something, so they would make it. And so they made it for a specific need. And now 40, 50, 60 years later, you know, needs change. And so everything needs, to, uh, everything can, maybe not need, but everything can be improved over time, all the time and, and, and infinitely, you know, and that's why also having a studio is a <laughs> bottomless money pit. Huh. Well, so that's, bringing to mind some interesting thoughts. Um, I've never thought about it like this before, but I think about plugins, you know, music plugins, uh, virtual mm-hmm. instruments, synths and stuff like that. And all the great composers are always, you know, not just using the presets, they're yes. creating their own yep. sounds, which, yep. which I guess is an analogy. But I'm also thinking about um, newer gear versus older gear. Um, and I'm wondering what newer stuff you've seen modified. For example, have you ever seen a modified distressor? Um. Uh, you know, it's really, really funny that you bring that up because um, I so I like to record. This is something I share with Michael is I like to record things really, really loudly. Uh, and then if it's a source that's not super loud, um, I like to really crank up my preamps. And I'm not talking about cranking things to the point of distra- uh, distortion, but just having it as open as possible. And a lot of people just check levels in Pro Tools or, you know, whatever their DAW of choice is. Um, But that's not, you should, people forget to use their ears. And so one of the things with me is my vocal chain, um, the mic will change depending on the singer. I, you know, I have a really nice 47 and a nice 67 and a nice 251 and I'll I'll change up, but you know, sometimes it could be a 57 even, but one of my almost always to go to preamps is a tube tech MP1A. And, um, I like to really crank that thing. And then the first compressor in the chain is usually my distressor. Because it's really fast, it could be really transparent, or it could be really aggressive, and you can really work with it. And recording this way has made it, um, it almost always distorts on the distressor side. 
And I called, uh, they're super nice at that company at Empirical yeah. Labs. And, and I called them and I said, hey guys, here's what's going on. And Judy was like, hey, let me, I'll connect you with the tech here. And uh, <laughs> the tech was really nice, but he was also a little baffled. And uh, he got into this like kind of tech mode and he was like, uh, you're, you're using it wrong. But we have so much headroom and it should never distort. And I said, well, I'm, I'm not necessarily telling you that there's something wrong with the unit. I'm just asking for you to change a few things in my unit um, so I could have way more headroom and really be able to push my preamps hot without worrying about the distressors distressing or uh, distorting. Mm. And, um, you know, he asked to give him some time. And then uh, before we got back to it, I ran into um, Dave Durr at mm -hmm. AS at one of the studio parties. And he was so nice. And he instantly knew what I was talking about. He, he, he was like, oh, yeah, no, of course. Oh, the tube tech. Oh, sure. Yeah. You like to d drive that thing to, to get the full headroom in it. And of course, I'll, I'll just send you. We have these custom attenuators that we send for the distressors. There's like a minus six, a minus eight, and maybe a minus 12. He says, you know, see which one uh, works best for you. And don't worry about um, they it won't degrade your sound, which with Dave, I trust a lot of people say, Hey, put this in between your chain and, and it won't degrade your sound. And I'm, I'm really big into a being. Yeah, and yeah. so things, things tend to make a difference. And I, you know, I don't like it usually. Um, but anyway, so my, my distressors, uh, are modded. They're just externally modded, but they are modded. So if, you know, funny, you should bring that up. Um, you know, that also reminds me of another story. I remember hearing about Michael recording guitars, and I think this was back around the same time you were first working with them. So there was this story of somebody who's building guitar splitters where they would match all the transformers one-to-one mm -hmm. -one mm -hmm. perfectly so that you're, <laughs> when you malted out your guitar to different amps, it would have no, or either no degradation of the guitar signal or absolutely the, yep. the least possible. Yep. You know? The least possible, yeah. It's, it's, all, there's, it's always in the chain, especially with guitars reacting to loads and, um, you know, so, so obviously every amp is different, so you can't, there's no way to match, but yes, there, I, I and I know that specific splitter, um, that was, I can't remember who built it for him, but I, you know, we've worked with it, um, recently or for a lo very long time, I use, um, Jonathan Little, um, mm -hmm. his company is Little Labs and they make incredible gear. Um, Jonathan was the tech at Conway when I was at Conway. Um, but his schooling is he came from, a and M studios, and you know, again, when they would have a need, they would build stuff. So Jonathan built incredible things for A and M, uh, and I've been a supporter of Little Apps for a very long time. And what I use is his uh, PCP box, which is um, it's a guitar splitter, but it's also a reamp box. Before the whole reamp hype, you know, before other kind of lower end companies started making reamp stuff. Um, and if you have two PCPs, which I have, um, the second box could kind of in, uh, behave as a satellite box, but again, with almost no uh, change in tone. And so I always have one, there's one in my rack in the control room, and then I have a floater one that can go in the booth or in the live room. Or uh, And so, you know, we split stuff usually in the control room. And we use that with Michael, and he loved it so much that when he went to um, Europe to make the Mew record about I want to say two years ago, <laughs> but that could be three, four years at this point, uh, he ended up buying uh, two also, so he could do, have the same setup. So he could have the, you know, the control room setup and then the live room setup and the two boxes just, um, I mean, they don't talk to each other, but they talk to each other and yeah. it's really incredible. We, and I've, like I said, I'm a big a beer. I've a beat, um, a few other boxes that claim to have these, um, I won't mention other brands, but the the second closest brand, I mean, it sounded like you, something was broken. It was, it was wow. that bad. So I'm a big believer in the little lab stuff. They make really great um, stuff. And they make this other thing too called the STD. It's a, I don't know what it's, it's like maybe signal transmission device, but it's a. That's an it's interesting a, name. Yes, for I know. He there. has funny names. PCP stands for professional to cheesy pedal. So oh, that's funny. He has funny names. But um, so it's a cable that you plug into your guitar in the control room, but then you can feed it through an XLR and it goes to a, 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 a kind of like a box on the other end. And again, you can run, I can't remember how, how far, maybe 150 feet, maybe even longer uh, with no degradation. It has two 9-volt batteries in the box that receives the cable, and it's really, really incredible. It's, it's, a, it's a big um, uh, 
uh, just a big tool. Jonathan makes really great gear that some people don't get excited about because it's not, you know, it's not another Fairchild in your rack or, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it doesn't have big view stuff, but, but it's pristine equipment that is, is a, a tool that's needed by everyone. Yeah. And, uh, and it essentially doesn't mess up your tone. It just does what it needs to do without interfering with, you know, the great boxes that you're interconnecting that with. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, so the example of, uh, the STD, which sounds to me like a long line driver uh-huh. pedal, right? Um, that that's something that you really need when you're in the studio a lot, recording a lot of guitars, and you're totally. trying to get from the control room out to to another space. Totally. And so you know, the, those he's definitely solving problems for people who are serious about recording totally. in the studio. Yeah. The, the IBP, which is the uh, the phase, yeah, box. the continuous phase. Oh my god, yeah. yeah, I have two of those, and um, yeah, I mean, it's incredible. It's incredible. Well, yeah. that's cool. Good shout out to Jonathan yeah. Little. Yeah. Um, and in fact, the uh, the PCP is exactly what I bought based on reading about you guys having that special splitter back oh, in the perfect. day. So it's incredible, here. yeah. And now yeah. that's the one. It, make sure I'm talking about the same one. So mine has the the variable volume. You can send it at different levels to different amps and phase Correct. flip it and yep. everything like that. It kind of goes and in every direction you want. It goes in every direction, um, and and it really is a fantastic box. And like I said, um, uh, having two of those really kind of steps it up because then you have so the back of of the box has a not satellite was expansion expansion and expansion out and so you can connect the two boxes and uh, essentially the one in the live room is as if you're plugged straight into it and it really you know i've i've michael and i have a beat extensively and it really is as close as you can get to directly plugging your guitar i've also made a, f- a few records um with it with um this really phenomenal blues player josh smith um i've produced a few records from and he's He's one of those guys who's really, really incredible, and um, you know, but blues does, doesn't make as much money as everything else. So he usually tours with, you know, some American Idol or you know those kind of uh, caliber guys. But when he makes his own records, he makes these inc- makes these incredible um, blues records. And Josh is is really, really uh, picky about his tone. He pretty much only goes uh, straight into an amp. Uh, and, and with me, we've, you know, he's, he's, he's trusted me to, to use the PCP because he's heard how close it is. And we've made a lot of his records, um, you know, using the PCP and going into multiple amps and, uh, and doing that kind of a thing. So in fact, I'll after the interview, I'll send you a link to a really cool record that we've done. And a lot of times it's like traditional blues he does, or like a more soul blues, but we've made this one record that's like a Hendrix meets cream. Oh my God. It's incredible. Is that, and is that letting you go? Uh, no, that's a really great, um, kind of like soul, yeah. uh, record the, that one is called, I think over my head. Yeah. Over my head. Really, really incredible. Man, the tones on the record is really good. He really wanted to play live in the room, no headphones. And so it, you know, that introduced a challenge for me because I really like, I mean, I love capturing live in the studio, but I also mm-hmm. really like fidelity. I like to get the greatest, greatest sounds. And I never want to say, Hey, this is really good. You know, we've recorded it all in this room. So, you know, bear in mind, I, I, I like to hand people a record and say, you're welcome, you know? Right. So, um, and so, so that record really what, has no, what yeah, you're implying ahead, is that you wanted to have everybody in the room, but you needed to get some isolation on the instruments at the same exactly. time. And he, and he still, you know, since we've made other records using multiple amps, he now wanted to use multiple amps, but while playing with everyone else in the room. So the, you know, the guitar sound was huge in the room and we've needed to I- isolate it. And that record really shows how great it could sound with also with everyone playing in the room. So drums, bass and guitar were all done live. And I believe we just overdubbed vocals later. Um, one, this incredible ballad, um, has Jeff Babco, um, on on um, this really really cool Wurlitzer that I have, and um, yeah, maybe in one more vocal overdub uh, by another singer. But yeah, it was pretty much all live and really incredible. Jo- Josh is a he's an animal. He's a he's an amazing player. Nice. Well, so let me let me back up and keep asking you a couple of dumb questions. Yeah. So Josh is in the room with the bass player with the drummer, so that they don't have to have headphones on. Is Actually, right? they opted. They opted to have headphones. They ended up definitely the drummer wanted, and I think uh, Calvin, the bass player, also wanted headphones. But Josh definitely wanted to get that vibe in the room. Um, so yeah, so go ahead with so, your question. So in yeah. the in the room with headphones on, the drums are in that room, but the guitar amp and the bass amp were yeah. in ISO booths, and that's where the 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 um, PCP. 
came in handy. Actually, being the guitar, it? the bass, the bass amp was in an ISO booth, but to have Josh be able to play with no headphones, we had to leave the door slightly open so the bass still got in the room. And um, but jo- all Josh's guitars were in the room, and we had to not just baffle them in a specific way, but also point them in a specific way that kind of canceled out by the time it hit the drums. But if you listen to the overheads on that record and definitely the room mics, you know, you definitely hear guitars and bass. We just had to get it right. So then in the mix, it wasn't washy. It was still, you know, I I had to aim to the tone I wanted, not an acceptable tone that I'll fix later. Right, right. Okay, cool, man. Dig it. Um, Well, I definitely got some great questions for you about many of the records you've done. So why don't we just jump right forward and and dig into some specifics? Um, Actually, before we do, I do like to ask our guests to share an inspirational quote as we kick off the podcast. Anything you want to talk about before we... I I do, actually. um, It's not really a quote, but it's a Michael Beinhorn one. And uh, Michael used to say when we just started working together... Um, any any idea that would come up and we'd start theorizing on whether it would work. And Michael would always say, there's only one way to find out. And oh, I, I love, <laughs> love that. I love that. And 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 it's it's a big thing to me to not rely on assumptions for creating art. Um, and if you're cur- curious about an outcome or a process or a sound or a treatment, you should definitely, definitely go for it. And, um, and, and but with that said, don't worry about, if you spent two days on trying something out, if it's not working out, don't force it to be used. You know, go ahead yeah. and say, okay, we tried it. It didn't work. Let's let's do something else. But I love there's only one way to find out. And it's really pushed me to always, you know, even if there's a deadline or let's let's if 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 someone's curious about this, l- let's explore this. I love that. I think that's great. And I'm not suggesting that I'm as good as Michael Beinhorn yet, but <laughs> I also say that in the studio. I listen to people sometimes, you know, start to deliberate over something and it's like, Hey, we could sit around and deliberate it, or we could just find out if it's going to work by doing it, you know? Or absolutely. You know, other places I feel like that actually is happening real world is particularly in arranging. When you got the band out in the studio and there's a suggestion for an intro of the song or an outro or something, and people start talking about it, and, you know, maybe somebody's a little concerned that, well, yep. I mean, is that a good idea? Or, you know, and, then, and my, my suggestion is always like, um, same, same kind of thing. It's just for me, the best thing to do is try each one of them and just get rid of the ones that don't work. You know, you end up I'm with very vocal. Best. Yeah, I'm very vocal about that. And especially working with session players because they come from the place when they work with me, uh, I, I really create the space for them to, to really uh, express themselves. But they come from the place where time, you know, all right, one take. OK, that's good enough. We'll fix it later. OK, one more take, one more take. And I really say, let's hear it. Let's 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 take a minute or five or ten and let's really explore this direction, even if it is to, to find out that that's the direction that isn't going to work out for the song. Um, yeah, uh, b- because it, it I feel like it always brings you closer to what is. Yeah, it's in infor- it informs you. You learn a little bit of something. Absolutely, because perspective is everything, and you see it in life too. It's not just in art. Perspectives, it, it just it, it's a you know it's a geolocator. It just shows you where you are. It's also a little bit more exhausting to worry about whether something is a good idea than it is to just try it real quickly. Totally, and then question yourself if you should have gone there, and if is it good enough now, and should. So absolutely, I believe in uh, in, in not necessarily exhausting all your options, but but. If if you're excited about finding out something, go go for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I guess one last thought on that is as a band trying the idea, the band can tell you whether it feels right to do it like that or not. And whoever's in the control room can kind of just record it quickly and they can tell you whether it sounds totally in the control room. And <laughs> totally. As long as you got trust there, then you're you're likely to arrive at the right decision. Absolutely. And there are they are two worlds. A lot of times, um, you know, a lot of times a, a band is convinced and I tell them, come listen in here and they'll come in the control and be like, oh, that's not what that take felt like. And I say, I know, but that's that's how it's translated and it'll be translated to the to the listener. So we have to, um, you, you know, we have to to take that into account. But also, if they're super excited about what they did feel in the live room, I'll then go in the live room and sit one in with them and, and really and if I'm feeling it, if they're you know, a lot of times when you're not playing, you can be a little more objective. But if, if while still not playing, if I hear it, if I hear that mojo that I can't rec- well, I couldn't so far recreate in the control room, then right. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll go for it. Yeah. And so it's, it, it is, it's important to just not um, discount things just because whatever time or, you know, impatience, impatience has no room in art. You know, art takes 
an infinite amount of time. It takes as long as it takes. So yeah, I, you know, a takeaway for me from what you just said is on either side of the glass as quickly as you can try and get through the glass into the other person's shoes and understand what they're experiencing. Absolutely, and you'll get to the right answer quicker. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, yeah. Groovy. So um, let's see. I wanted to ask you uh, about you know you, you. I found a great collection of your records. Um, and I've, I've grabbed some YouTube links, which rock stars all include in the show notes so that you can check those out. Right. And then also you've got a wonderful producer reel on SoundCloud. So I'll include that as well so that people right. can check out your music. So for example, um, you, I know you just finished producing and mixing a record for Grant Ganser, um, contestant on the voice. And I wonder mm-hmm. if you wanted to kind of tell us any stories about doing that. Yeah. Grant, Grant is an incredible singer. Um, he was on the voice when he was 16, which is really, I mean, it blows my mind. Um, he was a huge fan of Alan Stone, or he is a huge fan of Alan's, and he actually auditioned for The Voice with Unaware, which is um, a song I produced for Alan. Uh, and actually, Unaware, it's funny because it, it's the song that everyone, like all those shows, end up bringing on the show. Uh, and it's a song I was really, really involved in, um, doing a lot of just kind of inside stuff and uh, more than just, you know, capture the recording of. So, uh, I'm very proud of that song, and you know Alan is incredible. So Grant reached out to me and said, "Hey," or his management reached out to me and said, "Hey, Grant's a big fan, and he really would like to uh, work with you." And so Grant and his manager flew out to LA, and we met at my studio. And he had, you know, he had prepared prepared a few songs and sung them for me. And I knew right away that he was incredible. But I, again, back to connecting to that that point of where you wrote the songs. Um, he, he was nervous. And so he wasn't really tapping in. He was just, essentially he was performing. It could have been someone else's songs, you know? Right. Um, and so, uh, one of the songs was called, I want it bad, which is now possibly will be the single on the record, but he was performing it for me. And I said, Hey, you know, you're saying I want it bad, but I'm, I don't feel that you want it bad. And we started really talking (laughs) about it. And so I gave him some homework and, um, it's a good way for me to, weed out a lot of people who aren't committed to the to the process. And uh, Grant spent a few months really doing the homework and then reached out again, came out again, and we've started really doing the, you know, the writing thing. And uh, then he went to Nashville to uh, write with this guy, JMR, Josh, um, nice. and co-wrote, you know, so, uh, maybe about half the record he co-wrote with Josh and then uh, the rest he did on, on his own and, and, you know, with my feedback. And, um, He's incredible. Grant, his voice, he has a beautiful voice. Um, and he, like I said, he was really committed to the process. We actually spent almost 13 months on the record. And, uh, and I'm not talking about, you know, we did two months here and a month there. We, we spent a year on this record. And, um, and it was really, really important to go through this process to, to, to bring him to where he needs to, to, to go and where he needs to be. And, and I'm very, very, I know he is too, but I'm very proud of this record and I'm excited for people to hear it because it, I can't even describe the, the genre. I mean, essentially it's a pop record. You didn't have to specify sob genres, but, um, Grant writes really, really kind of modern pop. And, uh, when I heard his voice and his tendencies and I asked him about his influences, I could tell that this needs to be a soul record mm. that possibly has some modern pop treatments, but not, it shouldn't be a modern or an urban pop record that then has some soul treatments. I, this needs to be a real soul record that then, you know, we do some pop treatments to it. And so that's what, you know, we, we ended up with and it's, it's a really incredible record. Well, yeah. that's cool, man. That's cool. And I, I'm happy to hear you talk about Alan Stone. I know he's another fantastic artist that you work mm-hmm. with. I've had the pleasure of recording him a couple of times at my studio at Bonnaroo. And uh, my first question is, does he show up in your studio wearing those cool glasses? He does. He does. He actually not just showed up in my studio, but he slept in my studio um, for the duration of, of making the record. Um, he was, you know, he was not quite just starting out. He already had the band that he pretty much has today. I think a few players have changed, but so they're touring extensively. Um, but when he was in town and we would record, um, he would stay on the couch because, you know, it was the only way we could afford to make the record. And, um, yeah, Alan is the coolest dude. Uh, he does wear the crazy big glasses. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and he really is, uh, you know, I have to share, I, his manager and my manager at the time, uh, knew each other. And then my manager at the time said, Hey, you know, this manager has an artist that he'd like us to go see. He had a bigger band on Columbia and then he had, you know, Alan who was just starting out and we went to see him. And as he was setting up, 
I was like, all right, let's catch one song and leave. You know, I, I've seen a million song singer songwriters and I, I totally, I mean, I admit, I totally judged the book by its cover. I, I was just like, all right, let's watch this surfer kid, you know, do a song and let's leave. And then he opened his mouth and I was so blown away. Before the end of the first song, I said, I, I'm going to make this guy's record. And, and then he played more songs and more songs. And then we started talking, um, you know, a few weeks later and he came by the studio and he's, he showed his, his port his, um, uh, uh, body of work is incredible. I mean, he writes constantly and I feel like everything he writes is, is a, not necessarily a hit, but everything he writes is a phenomenal song. Yeah. Cause he's, and he knows has how counterpoints. To sing his ideas. Yeah. Yeah. He, he knows how to sing. He's really smart. He's well-read. So his, his lyrics are great. Um, he, his, his, acoustic or his guitar work is incredible. You know, people think that he's a singer who also plays guitar, but he's a phenomenal, specifically acoustic guitar player. Um, he has counterpoints and he has these really smart moves and uh, it's super melodic. His acoustic playing is really melodic and his rhythm work is great. I mean, he's, he's really, the he's he's a great, great uh, musician. Now, uh, and I'm a big fan of his. You know. I know those guys as doing it kind of as a, a soul band where it might be a full band and he's right. singing on top. Do you sometimes record with him where it's just him and a guitar? Uh, with Alan, because he was touring so extensively, um, he would actually come and, and perform the song. We, you know, we I'd make some suggestions and we'd fine tune the song, and then uh, I'd figure out what's what's the nearest tempo that's great. And he would, uh, I would lay a click, and then he would lay an acoustic guitar. He would sing. And then he would leave for two. So we do three, four songs like that. And then he would leave for two, three months. And I would demo a whole lot of stuff. You know, I would demo yeah, a ton. Fun. Originally, that record had a lot of um, program drums on it. Um, not that that wasn't the intention for the for the whole record. But, um, uh, you know, it was just a, a demo. And then we ended up, uh, I won't say which songs, but we ended up keeping some of the program drums just because they felt so great. Um that we ended up, um, you know, keeping that, but, but the, mostly the band was the same guys that we used on Josh's records. It's the Raphael Sadiq guys. It's Calvin Turner on bass who I have, there's not, they're not enough words to say he's a great guy. Amazing bass player. I mean, he's an amazing producer too. He's done, uh, um, he's made some cool records and he's just, he's an incredible musician. Lamar Carter on drums, who's again, the coolest guy and a phenomenal, phenomenal drummer. And Josh Smith, who's, like I said, is a um, great friend and uh, and just a great, he's a phenomenal, I think he's one of the best guitar players on the planet right now. Um, and is that the same Josh that he was co-writing with in Nashville? Or no, Josh? that's a different guy. I, I can't remember Josh's full name. I know he goes by JMR. JMR, but, um, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice, man. Well, um, let's see what else I want to ask you about that. Another thing. Oh, sorry, just to finish real quick. So, just I want to so people don't think that all of Alan's uh, songs were done uh, with him singing without the band and then leaving. We would only use that for the demos. And once we cut the songs, Alan came in and, and sang for real, and we did pro, you know proper singing. And the same with the well, we kept some of the acoustic guitar from from demoing, but but mo definitely his vocals were you know keeper vocals that we did later. I don't want people cool. to think that he half asked them. Well, I like to record that way. I mean, like when you're not going to record a band all performing live together, I always find it's it's really helpful to put something that feels like a really meaningful guide track. Totally. You know, like I'll put one mic in front of an acoustic and a, a voice and totally. just let that be the yeah. guide track and yeah, then just so play feels, everything yeah. to that and then yeah. finally come back. So Absolutely. Great way to do it. Um, so another note I made about the Josh Smith record, um, I wanted to ask you what, what you can tell us about using tight, this is a little bit more of a mixing question, mm -hmm. um, but you, what, what can you tell us about using tight and punchy effects on a mix like Letting You Go for Josh Smith? How do we add space around sounds without killing the funk? Well, I, I record with a lot of space, uh, and so that's a big thing for me. Um, and I've, I always have. Um, I, I, I like to capture space because all my favorite records have a lot of space. And so that's, you know, that's mostly where it's coming from. Um, but like I said before, when everyone was playing in the room together, even for records that I don't do that way, I still make sure that the space between the instruments 
is is correct. It's phase is a huge thing for me, mm -hmm. um, and I, I I make sure phase is always 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 great. And um, I have this whole thing when we do multiple amps on guitars, I, I go through this really tedious process of phase checking everything and and making sure everything is in phase because people you know people think that getting a five amp guitar tone is always going to be big, but mostly for most people, it's actually much smaller than just the one amp because mm -hmm. phasing eats at your tone. So back to you know, getting that space and not eating at the funk. You have to get it right the first time. You have to treat the space as not, you know, a lot of people go for these, uh, the room mics. Well, if you solo them, they sound like a Zeppelin track, but that goes, it'll go on like a Maroon 5 track on a thing. So in the mix, just no one's going to use it. You know, maybe on a drum breakdown, they'll use it, but they won't use it. So get the space sounding correct for your song uh, rather than for your friends to impress later, you know? So uh, two questions about that. When you say it sounds like Zeppelin, you mean it's like got this big, you really hear yeah. the reverb on it and yeah. stuff. But when yeah. you start stacking stuff in a in a mix, it's just a wash and it just goes Yeah, away it gets so mushy. Yeah. 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 Okay. Exactly. And then um, when you talk about getting the phase right on the guitars, I think most of us, uh, if we've never heard about phase before, we don't even know what that means. Right. And so the first answer to that is check your polarity, right? Check the phase right. polarity. Right, so the polarity. And but on, there, but on a console, about other kinds of phases as yes, well. Yes, yes. So on a console, you know, you could only do in phase and out of phase, which is you know 180 degrees. Mm -hmm. um, and so there, you know, we talked about Jonathan's IBP, where you can sweep continuous phase from essentially from zero to uh, not infinite infinity, but you know, he has the the button that goes from 90 to 180, and then, so you can do 180 plus. I think it's plus 180, so you're almost 360 back. Um, but but phase is a essentially if you have a sine wave and you have a sine wave, if they're shifted one from each other, then those areas that overlap, you, you'll start getting comb filtering, and you're you're starting to lose a lot of the tone that you're loving about the one mic. You're and about the second mic. Now that you're uh, superimposing them one on the other, you're losing some of those frequencies yeah. because they're not happening at the same time. Like a comb filtering. Exactly. And so I, you know, I check phasing all the time. You know, by but let's say I'm 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 uh, bussing guitars. Let's say I have I don't know anywhere from five to ten lines. It it doesn't have to be ten amps, but maybe one amp has two mics on it, and a DI is always you know, and a DI is always earlier than than the amp. Mm -hmm. So I find out, and a lot of times. I'll put the DI on the IBP because the DI can always tend to to be swept a little later mm -hmm. in time, and that's what I like the IBP. Uh, so I'll have the amps all you know phased correctly, and then throw the DI on, and usually that phases a little bit, and then I'll sweep the IBP until I find that perfect phasing point between the DI and uh, the mic. Because when you strum the guitar, the DI gets the electric signal, but the mic has to you know, travel through the speaker, go all the way to the mic, hit the mic, be converted to electricity, and then travel back through the preamp. So it's always, the amps will always be later than the DI. Um, so let's say you've got two mics on an amp. You've got a 57, and you're feeling like you want to kind of eat the, the speaker sure. cone a little with that. Sure. But then you got a, a FET 47, a large diaphragm condenser. Right. And you feel like that's ah, too close. I want to back it up a little bit. W m might you put an IBP on the 57 and try and time align that slightly I, with the I, condenser? I, I, I used to do that. And it's, I mean, it's still a phenomenal tool. But what I do now is I'll, a lot of times I'll just put my ear, I don't use the, you know, three feet or four feet or I'll just move my ear around until I find the great sound for that 47 FET. And mm -hmm. then, and then I'll have the guitar player play and I'll see the relationship between those mics. And then I'll adjust one of, of the two. Um, and sometimes it could be two inches, you know, it doesn't actually have to be perfectly in phase. It just have to sound right. And so sometimes, you know, the wave where it sits is just, it's just right. You know, some of the greatest guitar tones of all time are not in perfect phase. Right. They're just, they just sound great. And yeah. so it's, it's really about, and you know, and again, I always push to specifically to interns, uh, but to artists also to not look so much the, the fact that we have a visual representation of our recording in front of us at all times um, it is really disruptive to to again to creation of art and and mm -hmm. people obsessing over the grid or you know phase or I always say what do you hear you know what do you hear is the sound you're hearing is it great and if it is then who cares if it's out of phase or in phase or slightly or you know and the same with the grid it's it, it has to feel right and sound right and then the rest is now if you're having challenges and things are weird, 
then sure, you can print the two mics to different tracks and then look at the actual waveform and be like, okay, I see what's happening here. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, learn to use your ears for that is, is really critical. So here's a good question. How do we put our ear in front of the amp and not lose our hearing? Um, <laughs> that's a great question. D definitely key is to limit it to very, very short periods of time, uh, exposure. Um, definitely, you know, don't, don't put it at 120. I mean, sometimes I'll run the SVT at almost like 115 dB, which is, I think it's like a jumbo jet taking off. <laughs> wow. It's, wow. it's intense. And so you also have to have the right mics in front of it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, but for short periods of time, you can do it, but be very conscious. And this is a big thing with players, specifically guitar players. Sorry, guitar players out there. But guitar players will have this tendency of playing what you want for exactly seven seconds. And then right when you put your ear in front of the, <laughs> of the amp and you're essentially you're burning uh, – uh, you're burning your your uh, your eardrum. They'll start noodling and not doing what you need them to do right then. And you have a very very short uh, uh, window to use. You know to judge with your ears before they burn out. And so it's really important to to be um, firm with your guitar player. You know it could be really any session player, but <laughs> specifically guitar players, they just love to go into the the noodling. And again, I was a guitar player, so I I know where that comes from. And um, so be very specific about, you know, if you're now just checking attack of chords and they want to go into a lead solo, just go, no, like I need yeah. you right now. We'll do that later. We, I need you right now to just hit these chanks. Just do chanks. I'm listening for, you know, whatever it is, the decay on the reverb or the thing or the phase or and, and be very specific. Because, again, like you said, don't 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 kill your ears. So, yeah, uh, there's yeah. another sort of a Murphy's law I've discovered in the studio is when a musician is playing a part and you reach over to the knobs to set the level, the moment you touch the knob, they stop playing. <laughs> Absolutely. It's incredible how that works. It's, it really is incredible. Um, this really great drummer, Craig McIntyre, who he's most of the year he's on tour with the Goo Goo Dolls, um, but he's. I've made a few records with him. Um, I met him through Michael. We've made a we made a really great record together, and I've used him on almost every record since. <clears throat> and he's told me once where we would sit in the live room and work on a song, and he would play these amazing things. And then you know I'd go back into the control room and hit record and play, and the take would end, and I'd be like, okay, that was great. Let's do another one. I feel like that one is is a little stiff. And Craig says he he says he always feels that the red light going on, it just instantly, he's conscious of that we're actually recording this time. And this guy has played on, I don't know, hundreds of records, maybe more. And it's just, there's a thing where you're, like you said, when you reach for the console, they just become aware and then they stop or they change or, and yeah. so you have to be, you know, you have to be clear also in um, uh, directing your wishes. People, you know, people get annoyed with, well, with people, <laughs> but people get annoyed with musicians or with artists who, don't do what they expect them to say, but that's just a conversation you're having with yourself in your own head until you direct your wishes and express, this is what I need from you now. You know, it, you could be polite about it, but you know, you don't have to baby, uh, anyone or sugarcoat anything. You just be, Hey, I need you to play just this chord. I mean, it could be just this chord for six minutes. Yeah. That that's what you need. And that also will serve that session player better in the end product. So you're not, he's not doing you a favor. You know, you're you're actually doing him a favor by yeah. being very specific with him and saying, "Hey, I need this from you right now to get this amazing tone." And you know, a hundred percent of the time, guitar players come to me and go, "I've never heard myself like this." And so that's, that's great. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And it hasn't been recorded yet, which is why they have to do so much. Yeah. If you could record it and just play the recording over and over again, well, of course you do that. But of course, we haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> no, no. All right, so um, let's talk more about bass. Uh, I made a note to ask you how you got the huge bass sound on all take for Lexi share and what, oh, yeah. what tips do you have for killer bass? Um, also when you talked about the SVT at 115, mm -hmm. I remembered another <laughs> takeaway story from you, you and Michael Beinhorn, you guys described doing the Marilyn Manson bass at such loud volume that the room was compressing the sound before it even got to the mic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that and I think the corn record that he did, which I wasn't part of, um, I believe they did something like that too. Um, th there's a specific sound, and and people um, people argue about it all the time, and they'll send me people are really, are really into sending me technical articles of why things should matter, <laughs> but to me they matter because I hear them. You know, if I hear them, then I don't really care about the science. I like knowing the science. 
Um, but if if I hear a difference and you send me a paper on why it shouldn't make a difference, then I, I it it's meaningless to me. But yes, so recording really loud, there are a few things that happen. The 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 speaker cabinet starts distorting in a specific way, and it doesn't always sound like distortion, but it's it's the 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 cabinet is rattling in a specific way and the the speakers are coming out a specific way and the mic is receiving that in a specific way that everything is compressing and and it becomes really really present and it cuts through the mix in a really really special way mm. and to me that's kind of what that does and when you do that in a room and you have five you know five amps like with Michael the record I did with Michael um most recently um we had T two SVTs. We had one SVT going through an A10, another SVT going through. Uh, Michael has this crazy '70s 412 Marshall. That's a base cabinet, so it's thicker uh, and it's wider, and it just that thing is a monster. So we used that. Uh, we used a. Uh, that, was, that was the yes sound, wasn't it? Um, I thought I remembered hearing that those guys. Oh, were record on the 412. I think so. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he has, I have this, him and I have this um, other Yamaha amp that was, it was, I think it was originally a PA amp, but it just, it's really clean and it goes to a really, really um, low, but really clear note. You can really hear the note. So I like, like I said, I like bussing a lot of things together and get like, you know, get the drive from the SVT, but get the clarity from um, the Yamaha and then get, I have a really beautiful 63 uh, B flip top B15 um, and so, you know, I get the kind of warmth from that. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a really gnarly basement that we used on, on both on Josh's record and on a lot of stuff that I've used since, uh, it's a, it's a 69 basement, but it has vintage EVs in it. They're like, I think they're sixties EVs and they're massive and they just have a sound cause no one cares about basements. Like, you know, a lot of people mm -hmm. are, are indifferent to them, but there's a specific th thing they do with these EVs that just brings this clarity and punch to the bass that um, I remember Bob Dixon, who's like a legendary amp, um, you know, he's like an amp guru in LA. He does the Stones amps and McCartney's amps and, and he's been my tech for a long time. And I remember when I was looking for this specific cabinet with EVs, he, he essentially yawned. <laughs> he was like, Lior, why are you wasting time on this? I have, you know, seven basements here and no one cares about them. And I said, when you hear this, you'll know. And then when I finally found it, I brought it to him and he kind of serviced it. And uh, he called me and he said, oh, my God, I've never been this excited about a basement in my life. And he said it sounds wow. almost as, as as raunchy as an SVT. And it just so it's a combination of, of different colors and then putting them all together to a palette. And that I feel like is what gets that specifically on that I'll take song uh, with Lexi is, you know, one of those songs. Oh, I things. love that, dude. I love hearing that story. Um, and while it would be encouraging to all of us who, you know, just have a copy of a DAW in, in our home studio to for you to have said, oh, I used a plug-in, it's more, probably more exciting to me to know that mm, you guys really yeah. built it out of all these amps and, and the original recording sounded like that. You didn't have to oh, absolutely. create it out of, out of no, a DI. No, absolutely. I, yeah, I really don't do it. And I do, um, I have a, an evil twin. It's a... Uh, uh, this incredible tube DI that's made by Eclair Engineering. They don't make it anymore. They they made it through the 90s, then they stopped mm -hmm. making them, and then there was demand, and he started making them for another year or two. Uh, and I have a good friend of mine that that just grabbed one, but he doesn't make them anymore, and they're incredible. I highly recommend if, if you know people can find them. Um, it's, it's an incredible DI that I always, always use as part of the chain um, on bass. And it's actually a big, big part of... Um, uh, so usually I bus all, it doesn't matter how many amps I use, they all go to one track. So I commit, I don't do multiple, you know, playlists or I just commit. So one amp uh, track, one DI track, and then usually I'll run a bass driver into this. Um, I have this 1947 Gates preamp that um, mm. was used in broadcast in the 40s. And it's just very tubey and kind of big sounding. So I, I run a bass driver through that into a third track. So it's mic. Uh, or amps, you know, DI, and then a driver. Uh, and it's always, I always find the sound in recording. I don't, you know, I don't plan for later, honey, because, because, you know, once you then record guitars on it, you have to know what they'll sit on top of. And then right. once you do keyboards, you want to know. So I really plan for mixing right from day one, right from when we do drums. I'm, you know, I plan for mixing. Um, so a couple of quick questions. If you're taking those three different bass sounds to three tracks in Pro Tools, for example, right? Do you 
sort of arrive at a balance of those three and then try and hold on, hold tight onto what that balance of the three is as you keep working on the song, as opposed to sometimes turning up the distortion a little more or mm, using I more could, or less. I could turn it on. down. Uh, I mean, I could turn it up or down, but most of the time, again, yes. Like uh, I think I know where you're going with the question is I get the balance, right? I don't just get like hot level for Mike, hot level for DI and hot le- level for driver. And then later on blend them in pro tools. I, I want, I want the faders to always sit as close to zero as possible yeah. um, while maintaining that balance. So yes, I, you know, I do. And one of my tips for people who are starting or, you know, maybe have been doing it for a while is also always go brighter than you think with um, specifically drums and bass and, and sometimes even guitars because specifically with drums and bass, it's, they're the first things that you record and then you start stacking brighter things on top and you lose a lot of definition. A mm. lot of bass players, when I record with them, they're like, oh, are you sure this is really bright? And I tell them, trust me, I'm even with this brightness, I'm still going to reach for the EQ at mix time. Um, and, and, uh, and with Josh, it was a big thing because Josh really likes hearing his guitars, you know, the way they come straight out of the amp. And, um, he would always be like, ah, this is a little bright. And I said, Josh, just trust me or let's, you know, use headphones on this one. It's, uh, I'm going to be boosting these highs in the mix anyways. I'd like to at least capture them from the amp. So it's a cleaner, you know, it's a cleaner boost later rather than like the EQ has to find something that's not there. So, so um, last question about the, um, blending of bass elements into a single committed track. Um, do you are you sort of careful in getting each individual tone, and then when you're blending, you just kind of creatively follow your gut like a painter, and and don't look back? Or do you have a do you have any advice for making sure, in the same way that if you were putting plugins and compression on a track, and you wanted to keep checking that you weren't making your original sound worse along the way by fooling yourself? Right. Do you have any advice around that about blending different mics together? I do. I definitely like to. Um... I, I like to, and I recommend always a, a being all the time. So usually I'll start with the one mic and then I'll add the second mic. I'll maybe go in the live room and move it a little bit, come back, listen, you know, maybe figure out the phase or timing differences, but I keep, and then when I add the third one, I'll do the same thing. I'm not just, you know, I'll, I'll go back to number one and number two and see what they're doing together and, and, and so on and so forth. So it's, I, I recommend, you know, you keep checking and sure that that takes more time. And some people are like, well, I just want to record. I want to hit record. There's a value to that too. But to me, that's what pre-production is for. Right. Do, do the, you know, have the creative part of everything really, really down. And then let's, let's, let's make recording also a creative thing. Let's not make it a technical obstacle. Let's actually embrace it as a creative process of really, really finding what's the best that this could sound. Well, you know, you live in a movie making town. The level of technical um, elements that are going into constructing a recording in the studio is nothing compared to what they do to make a film, exactly. just to get like exactly. a minute of film, you know? <laughs> exactly. But exactly. I like that. I like that analogy and just that reminder that the value of that working creatively and quickly, those are highly valuable in the writing process, highly valuable in the demo and the, the discovery process. But once you have sort of this w- great blueprint for where you're trying to go with it, then let's include the the technical side of recording in that as well and make sure Absolutely. that we're really capturing a high quality Absolutely. sound. That's yeah. cool. And if you think about, you know, the Beatles and uh, Pink Floyd, Fleetwood Mac, you know, these those are records that so much uh, so much painstaking attention and time went into crafting, you know, sometimes one sound that appears once on a song, you know, it took them two days to, to figure what that is. And it, it's, it's worth it. You know, that's cool. Well, Hey, so let's take a short break and then we'll come back in and I'm actually going to, we can, we'll get to the jam session, but we'll include cool. continuing questions about records and recording techniques. Rock stars. Uh, you'll find links to the stuff we're talking about in the show notes. Um, We will try and also, we're going to get into the question of working with interns in the studio. And so um, we're going to take stuff we're talking about and these particular points about working with interns in the studio. We're going to make a special link and PDF for you to download from this show. You can find that at rsrockstars.com slash intern checklist. And um, we'll come back in in just a moment for the jam session. Roswell Pro Audio brings you microphone design that is out of this world. Endorsed by a growing list of artists and producers like Phil Collin of Def Leppard, Ross Hogarth, who's recorded Van Halen, Ziggy Marley, and the Doobie Brothers, and Super Dupes, working with Drake, Mary J. Blige, and Eminem. These are all rock stars that have discovered just how great Roswell microphones sound. 
Check out the Mini K47, which uses a capsule modeled on the one in the vintage U47 at a street price of only $299. Or the beautiful Delphos condenser microphone with a capsule tuned like the vintage U67 with great clarity and far lower noise at a street price of only $899. In fact, you are hearing my voice right now on the beautiful Delphos microphone. These mics are carefully crafted by hand and immediately feel good even before you plug them in and hear how great they sound. These are well-built microphones that will last you and your studio a lifetime of great recording. Check out more audio examples of these awesome mics at roswellproaudio.com. Are you having trouble getting your mixes to sound professional? Are you mixing and mastering yourself? Did you know that the vast majority of the world's best mix engineers almost never master their own mixes? So if you're thinking about hiring a professional mastering engineer, check out Chris Graham Mastering. Chris is a billboard chart-breaking mastering engineer who has mastered thousands of songs for both professional and home studio clients just like you. Send one of your songs to Chris and he'll master a sample of your song for free. If you decide to hire him, you can also get a free video mix consultation before mastering to help you get the most out of your mix. To learn more, check out chrisgrahammastering.com. Or just click the link in the show notes. Hey, rock stars, we're back. We're going to jump into the jam session. My guest today is Lior Goldenberg, joining us from Los Angeles. And Lior, are you ready to jam? I am ready to jam. Hey, guys. Awesome, dude. So I still got a bunch more questions to keep asking you about making Go records for it. Yeah. before we get into our usual outro. Um, we were just kind of talking about creating bass and and cutting guitars and making sure the guitars were bright enough as well. Uh, so I want to talk to you about guitars. Uh, there are guitars on Alanis Morissette's Under Rug Swept that mm. are I described as pretty massive. And I wanted to ask you, oh, and then also, you know, you, you did Andrew WK, Never Let Down. Both of those mm-hmm. records just have big guitars, different, yeah. different kinds of guitars. But w- what do you want to tell us about recording big guitars, you know, keep talking about that. Uh, I, you know, like I said, I, I like, I like guitars to really sing. Um, and, and guitars are just an exciting instrument. And so to me, it's a big thing is, is always capturing the tone and its purity. And sometimes that's just one amp. Um, a lot of, a lot of tracks we did on Grant's record that, uh, you know, the finalist of the voice that I just finished was, we did it with this incredible, um, tiny Morgan Princeton, uh, reverb. Mm. That's, that's just, it's just a beautiful amp and it's tiny and it just sounds magical. And we used it in tracking and we ended up keeping a lot of, at least the basic guitar tracks from tracking just because it was so special. And it's, it's huge sounding. It's a tiny amp. And so, like I said, a lot of times when you're combining a few amps if you're not very very precise you're actually making your tone smaller sure when you're sending in the live room you're hearing this massive sound but what your ears are picking up what your mics are picking up are two completely different things and yeah. you know phasing has to do with it the room you know people think again the accessibility of recording these days uh, a lot of people are recording in bedrooms there's it's a fine movement but but to get great great guitar tones Mm, it's 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 not always advisable to record in a in a room that just doesn't sound great. There's a reason that the big studios that are still out there have have made have churned out these incredible sounding records because the room is a huge part of what what the recording sounds like. And and you know people are like, well, for drums, sure, for strings, but not for no, absolutely for for a guitar, you know, one guitar amp that you put a 57 right on the grill, it, the room still makes a difference. Yeah, I have a couple of rooms in my studio, a dead room and a live room. Um, I call the dead room the phone booth because telling people you built right. uh, a dead room in your converted garage doesn't go over so well these days. Right, right. Uh, but but at the live room, the gallery, and they sound really different from each other. You know, yes. it's like a different yeah. low end response. There's a different you know, spa- a tail and a little bit of reverb on it. Yeah. And having different sounding rooms in, in the studio or, you know, maybe for the record, we'll go to do one thing here and one thing there in a different studio because having different sounds, essentially every room has its own um, uh, sonic character. And so when every track on your record has that sonic character, then that thing starts really uh, being out. It starts being undone, uh, out overly done 
um, you know, in, in the whole song, mm-hmm. and you start hearing specific frequencies that really jump out, which a lot of times are unpleasant. Yeah. And so, you know, moving things again, again, going to the the point where convenience shouldn't even be, uh, um, it shouldn't be where you come from when you're mm-hmm. making art. It, you should just always go for. If you have to deconstruct your room now and create a new, brand new space just for this one track, go ahead and do it. Don't think of how long it'll take and what a pain in the ass it is. Just go and do it because it, it, changing things up all the time, it, it just gets you creative and it gets better tones. Yeah. Although I will also interject that sometimes when the mic is up and it sounds pretty cool now, uh, you're good to go. You know, like don't go out and go move totally. a bunch of stuff around out totally. there because you'll actually change it again. <laughs> totally. I agree. I mean more like, okay, you've recorded guitars and now maybe you're doing leads. Yeah. Uh, don't don't leave it how it was for rhythm because leads, you know, there's a point the leads are almost like vocals on a record. They yeah. become a focal point, at least at that moment where they're performed, they become a focal point. So you know, change it up. Throw a room mic really far up or really far mm-hmm. away or or you know, throw an amp. I did um a really cool record. Um I just finished mixing it for a duo from Israel. They're called Raul with two A's and um it's a really cool it's kind of 90s uh vibe the it's a drummer and a guitar player and they both sing all the time and it's really 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 cool and the guitar player plays through essentially a bass amp to so it so you're not really missing the low end but on one of the songs we did um he was playing i can't remember if it was electric or acoustic but both singing and playing the guitar and we ran it into an amp uh, you know in the bathroom and i put i actually put the the microphone way up in the bathroom so it was it was kind of swirling in the, in the bath and then coming up to the top and picking it up there and and again you know i moved it like i was do i moved it around until it was the right color um, but it was an incredible sound and p- anyone who's heard it was like, what is that sound of that vocal and that guitar? And it's, you know, get creative with things. Don't, don't, you know, people are, people like being comfortable. And I, again, I think <laughs> being comfortable has no room in, in, in creativity, you know? Yeah. You're not pushing. If you, it's not a little uncomfortable, you're not pushing the limits. Yeah. 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 Um, I think we were just talking about this the other day when I was interviewing Mike senior and Eleanor Roosevelt quote that uh, she said, do one scary thing every day. Oh yeah. I love that quote. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, cool. So let's see, let's, what do I want to ask you about Uh, another band that has some great guitars on it and it's kind of a, like a different sort of a sound reminded me a little bit of green day was MXPX. Uh Uh-huh. Is that how you guys pronounce it? MXPX. Yeah. Okay, great. What what, what do you want to tell us about making a record like that and that kind of guitar sound and that sort of band? Well, that was really cool. That was um, uh, the late Jerry Finn, who um, passed away a few years ago, and um, he was re- just a really great producer, great engineer and mixer. And um, I-, I started that record at Conway's the second, and kind of you know started taking over uh, recording guitars on it too. And Jerry, uh, it was the same thing. You know, he also used a splitter. He also you know would set up four to 10 amps in the live room and you know we'd face check him really really thoroughly and then um you know and build start building sounds around what every amp is doing not try to have every amp uh do something it's not doing not try to get a you know a full the full tone from the one amp but have every amp do what it does best and then mm-hmm. see how how you can make them interact with each other um, to to create a uh, you know a larger sum of the parts. Interesting. And now, would you everything that you're using, you'd want to hear it all together, or would you sometimes use some of the amps and then for a chorus drop in more amps or something yeah, like that? Yeah, exactly. Sometimes I'll I'll drop to one amp, and sometimes I'll have all amps. And uh, and again, you have to be disciplined because almost always when you hear all the amps, you, you know you hear the angels going oh. You know, yeah. you're like, yes, I want that all the time. But I believe, and, and I approach my mixing in this way too, I believe that the recording process and then the mix process is, is um, it's it's almost like another instrument in the, in the track and, and definitely it's like a conductor. So you're responsible for things coming coming down and then going back up again and then, but not fully up. And then, so really build the song um, as an emotional roller coaster with mixing and then again with with the sounds so so definitely don't have everything on loud all the time because 
a, you know, people get tired of it. And then, you know, sometimes people will tell me, oh, you know, I really like that song, but I'm really tired after it. Like, I, I don't want to hear it again. And I explain, yeah. you know, I was loud on the radio because things are loud. And I explained to him that everything is on, on 11 all the time. And it's your brain is like, I, I need a break from this. Uh, so it makes me think about EDM, electronic dance music. Yeah, yeah. And just imagine, you know, if we, Rockstars, if you've been listening to EDM at all, you're probably familiar with the idea of the bass drop, you know, where you've got this 16 bar cycle that goes on. It's like a triangle wave or a sawtooth wave, you know, where it's like the song kind of builds up, builds up, and then it does this thing. And then the low end goes away and everything kind of goes up to the, to the moon and then all of a sudden there's a breath and then boom and the and the song starts over. Imagine what EDM would be like if that never happened and it just kept playing the, oh four, my the God. four kick yeah. for, for ten minutes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It would, wouldn't do anything. It'd have no exactly. effect, you know. And that's kind of what I think what um you know how in EDM uh the the kind of mix manipulation is a big part of the song itself. You know, the, yeah. the, the flanger thing. And like you said, the bass drop and the, the, you know, the comb filter, um, or the FM filter kind of sweeping through and then it comes back full range. That's really what it is. It's because it's a loop based, uh, genre. Everything is playing all the time. And, and, you know, I, I saw this assisting Manny Mariquin in the nineties a lot. It was my, really my first introduction to R and B and hip hop. I was a rock guy and a funk guy and a, you know, jazz guy. So I, you know, I, I never really, uh, I mean, I liked hip hop, but I was never there when it was made. So uh, assisting Manny when he was mixing a lot of nineties R and B, I saw that a lot of it was MPC based. And so, th you know, the loops were playing all the time and a huge part of the mix before he'd even do uh, fader rides would be putting in the mutes. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's essentially what the bass drop is in EDM today is putting in the mutes essentially rearranges the song um, to be uh, a dynamic performance, you know? Yeah, well, it's like if you can't get any louder, then the only place to go is to get quieter. Exactly, exactly. And, and that's where you should go. Absolutely, which is why, uh, you know, it's a good segue into EQing. I really like subtractive EQ. A lot of people like to, you know, more bass, more treble, more. But I really like to find a spot that sounds cool when I subtract the eq um it, it just clears the space uh you know in a track i i, I like uh, at as i saw one of those andy um um andy wallace talks mm -hmm. and he said how sometimes he cranks his ns stands really loud to almost to the point where the woofers crack mm -hmm. and then he'll go through the tracks and find which track when he mutes puts the woofers back in their place and that's the track he knows that he needs to, you know, do some subtractive EQ on. Wow. And I really like that idea. It's 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 kind of my philosophy, but in a in a more extreme, like, hey, I can afford to change the woofers on my NS10s. <laughs> um, <laughs> um but but that's that's kind of the vibe is is subtractive EQ is really great, especially if it's a project that I've produced, which means I've already got gotten the sounds that I want. And now it's more about making things interact with each other and and in that uh, aspect, subtractive EQ is really, really um, uh, handy. Yeah, so a couple of thoughts about that. I really like to be able to crank my mixes up. For some reason, that's just yeah. that's the genre I grew up in. I like to yeah. crank stuff up. I like to crank it up in the car. And, um, and it is really frustrating when you do crank it up and you discover that something's not right. You can just feel it. You know it's not right. It's like, yep. it, it's all there and I can hear everything, but why, why is this not working? Um, and it it's cool to be reminded that taking stuff away is the way to discover totally when, when stuff's you know what's causing it to not work. But it's also a reminder of what you talked about with the guitars. You got a short window to go explore that yeah, territory, yeah. or yeah. maybe do it just before you take a good long break. You know, uh, absolutely. And sometimes I'll plan it that way. And um, and you know, you you touched on listening to mixes really loud. It, you know, people think that the responsible thing is to only listen at really mellow volumes. I, I don't subscribe to that notion. I think that there, there are times to listen loud. There are times to listen really quiet. And there are times to listen at a kind of intermediate volume, uh, all to bring out specific things. Definitely. If you're going to mix loud all the time, your mixes are most likely not going to come out exciting because uh, they're, because they're exciting all the time when you're listening to them. So it doesn't force you to, to work on them and make them exciting when they're yeah. not exciting. You know yeah. what I mean? Which is well, part of the reason I use NS10s is because they, they, they don't sound amazing, but they make you work 
if you make the mix sound great on them, then, you know, anyone else who takes it to a nicer set of speakers or some, you know, hyped headphones that people listen on their iPhones and stuff, then it'll, it'll definitely sound better and more complimentary to the music. And so, you know, I, I think that cranking it in the car is absolutely a must because like you said, you find specific things, bass frequencies, um, are more, um, prominent when you turn things up. Uh, so mm-hmm. you definitely hear more kind of what's going on in the low end when you crank it up. Um, you also and, find out whether something hurts your ears in the upper totally, frequencies. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think it's finding that balance. It's knowing that because of the Fletcher Munson curve, which Rockstars is what Lior is talking about, it's just simply yeah. that that fact that we hear less low frequency and high frequency at lower volumes, yeah. and we hear more of it at higher volumes, which means we're looking for that sweet spot, that balance in a mix where we want to have enough excitement at the low frequencies, I mean, at the low volume, but you want to have enough sort of breathing room in your mix to be able to crank it up. Yeah. At the same time. Yeah, and you want you would just, essentially it's you know back to what we were talking about right in the beginning is perspective. You want perspective, which is why it's good to listen on on you know different sets of speakers uh, and go to the car and listen on your iPhone and listen on a whatever Bluetooth thing that you want to listen to or your laptop speakers or uh, it's just good to it, it doesn't mean that it should sound perfect on them, but as long as you know what other stuff sounds on them like it sounds like on them you know you could start getting perspective on what your mixes sound like it, it, compared to other you know, commercially available mixes. All right. Well, let's talk about another important thing in getting sounds right. Um, how do we get a vocal and a snare to be so in your face like you did on Run Like Hell for Tara Pre? Mm. Um, <laughs> that's a good question. Those are, those are two instruments. Sorry. Yeah, those are. It, well, they're you know they're they're s- sometimes similar in frequencies. The snare for me, it's a. Uh, it's kind of a compression thing. Uh, well, I guess with the vocal, it's a compression thing. Um, I definitely, when I record vocals, I like to record them. Obviously, you're, most of the time you'll be recording vocals when everything's already been recorded. And so again, don't just get a great vocal sound that's that only stands on its own. Make sure that you know it sounds great with every everything else. I, you know, I, there are specific preamps I have that sound huge. And um, if I record vocals through them, if I solo the vocal, it sounds incredible. If I try to put the vocal in the track, you can't make it sit in the track because it's so right. big sounding. It, you can't make it fit. And so make sure that the pairing you know, of the singer to the mic to the preamp, uh, that it sits well in the track before you start compressing and EQing. You know, People reach, I believe, because of also how easy it is to have a whole rack of EQs in a, you know, a channel in Pro Tools. Um, people reach for EQs way too soon. It's more like whoa, whoa, whoa! Move the singer closer to the mic. Move the singer, ba- you know, further back from the mic. Put some more gobos around the singer. Put the gobos in front of them. You know, it definitely treat the space before you're going to go and treat EQ because the EQ is is sure it's shaving off some problem areas, but you're also probably shaving off some complementary areas that would make your just like you said, it would make your vocal shine and sit forward in the mix in your face. Where if you're shaving this, you know what you consider to be harsh mids that really are only being introduced because you're recording in a not so great room, uh, but you're shaving those upper mids. But those upper mids are also what's going to make the vocal sit in your face mm-hmm. and 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 be really exciting. And so treat, you know, when I started learning music production, they teach you about signal flow, and signal flow is crucial for anyone who's starting out. You have to know where the signal starts from, where the source is. And as you're troubleshooting or as you're treating things, start from the beginning point. Don't start from the end point. Essentially, if you think of an EQ in a Pro Tools rig, um, you, I'm going to just count on my fingers. So you have the room, then you have the singer, then you have the microphone, uh, then you have the cable, the preamp. Let's say you're using one compressor, and then you have the interface, then you have the computer, and then you have the plugin. So the plugin is uh, ninth in the chain. So why would you reach for the ninth thing in the chain? Where you know if you're having uh, 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 if you have a broken pipe in your wall, you're not going to go close the faucet, turn off the faucet. You're going to you know reach for the wall and and plug it there before you put out other fires. It's the same kind of thought. Signal flow is really really critical, uh, and recognizing the the importance of it in the actual sound that is captured that is coming out of the speakers is really crucial for people who make records. You have to know that if a sound is not great when you put a singer in front of the mic, you should probably treat the room and try a different mic and try a different mic to preamp pairing. You know, I have incredible mics, 
that don't sound so great with specific preamps that those preamps are amazing too, but they just, you know, the pairing uh, a lot of times is, mm-hmm. is critical too. So, yeah, that's something that I began to learn here. Um, with, w- so in my studio, when I built it, I kind of stopped collecting gear as much, sure, uh, which is a good thing, you know, was, I yeah, didn't realize yeah. that at the time, but what it did is it allowed me to start focusing on really learning what I've already got, which it turns out I got plenty, yeah. <laughs> you got yeah. plenty of stuff for making great mm-hmm. records. And it, it forced me to start understanding the room and moving things around like you're talking yes. about, but also simple things that, um, you know, it's, I'm more capable of doing now, which is just like, take that mic, plug it into three different mic preamps and see yep. if one of them yep. sort of leaps out or not, you know, totally. Um, which is cool. And another thing that I've run into when recording vocals is, you know, for example, I have a Neumann U67, but I've also mm-hmm. got a Shure SM7B. Mm-hmm. And there are times where the 67 sounds so great by itself, but I put it in the track and I'm like, why is it just sitting so far Absolutely. back? You know? Absolutely. And then, you know, if you switch to a dynamic, all of a sudden it comes forward, but it maybe isn't as huge. Do you sometimes use combinations of two, like a condenser and a dynamic kind of voice? I I do. Um, Actually, on Grant's record, we used um, uh, a a really great 67. And then um, this mic that I've I've been using for about a year, um, this Monheim Omni mic, which if you haven't used it, I'll I'll connect you guys and you have to check it out. It's really incredible. uh, so, so you know the the omni is maybe about mm, four to five feet back from the and again you know you got to figure out the phasing between the two and and get them sounding right but and I don't always have the omni open you know I'll mm-hmm. open it in specific sections but at some point I've gotten so used to that sound that I just kept it open the whole time and it's incredible but I'll do that I'll do a forty seven uh, fet with a fifty seven lined up with it and I'll kind of drive the fifty seven a little harder. Um, I like my, the 67 with, um, with the Monheim a little further back. Um, yeah, I do. I like, I like mixing stuff up, um, and, and getting, uh, you know, a, a wider tone or like, a you know, this way you can actually bring something out without compromising the main full tone. Um, but you have a, another track where you can, you know, add in and, and take out a, a more aggressive tone or more kind of pokey tone, uh, as the song, uh, you know, requires it. Yeah. I guess there's no rule that says, uh, you know, if you can do it with guitar amps, you could do it with vocals. Totally. Why not, exactly. Know? Exactly. And I love that. And, and, um, yeah, like using that Monheim mic on, uh, on Grant's record, it's a huge, huge part of, of the, the, the size of Grant's, uh, I mean, he has a huge voice, but you know, when you hear someone singing, you never put your ear up to their mouth to hear them sing. You hear them in the room and, you know, probably at least six feet away, unless you're a weirdo (laughs) and you're standing on top of them. So, so it's nice to have the 47 or the 67 capture the fullness of the singer and the, all the details in the air, but then have that, you know, further back Omni mic pick up the ambience. And again, you, you know, to do that, you need a great sounding room, but if you do have that, then it's definitely something to consider. Now, when you talk about getting the phase right, are you talking about just checking polarity between the two mics or might you move one back and forth a little bit? Yeah. Exactly. I would move it. And, uh, you know, I, first of all, again, I, I always move my ears. I'll, I always keep a, a step ladder somewhere in the, in, in the room so I could, could even climb a little higher than, I'm, you know, I'm only 5'10". So I'll climb up up there and kind of hear, oh, it sounds nice here. And I'll put it up there. And sometimes it'll be too ambient mm-hmm. with the other mic. It'll kind of wash it out. But sometimes it's nice and sometimes it's almost there. But then you have to play with it, you know, a little lower, a little closer, a little further back. And then you get the phasing right. So if you like the way a sound is in the room, that's a good indicator that a mic might be, that might be a good yes. position for yep. a mic. And I always do that. Yeah. I always, it, especially with acoustic guitars, a lot of people have the, you know, point at the 12th fret and do the thing. I have a guitar player play and I'll just block one ear and, and use the one ear. I'll just move it really, really close to the guitar and find the spots that I'll, I'll kind of mark, soft mark the spots I like. And then I'll put a couple mics there and, and see what that sounds like. And then again, you, then you start, uh, you know, rearranging, but, but it's a good, I, I always use my ears to, to pick the spot. Now, do you also put headphones on and just move the mic around in front of an acoustic and, and trust when it sort of sounds cool in the headphones? Sometimes, but definitely first, uh, I'll do it with, with, um, my ear because the ear factors in the space and the headphones just have the direct, what the mic will pick up. And I want to know what the space sounds like, because if that one mic isn't picking that up, I would want to then add another one to, to add that space. in. so I want to be aware of that. Yeah. Okay, cool. So let's talk about that for a sec. Acoustic guitars. 
What are some cool ways that people aren't recording acoustic guitars now that you want to add to that? Um, particularly multiple mics. You talked yeah. about putting a couple of mics up. I, I really like, um, a, again, I, you know, I can't s say this enough, phase, phase, phase. Um, uh, it's really nice to have a KM84 on the, you know, on the fretboard and then a C12 or a, some nice Omni a little further back. And that they'll on their own they'll they'll both sound great, but putting them together will usually be washy and phasey. So so really, when you find the sweet spots, um, definitely then listen to them together and, and make sure that they sit well. You know, move stuff around and and don't worry about what it's supposed to sound like. Like that's why I like to use my ears because I like to see what it sounds like in there. And then it's just a challenge to replicate that coming out of my monitors. Um, cause if it's in the room, there's gotta be a way to capture it. Like Essentially that. if it's in the room and I can't get it, I'm failing, you know? So I want to, I want to be able to, to, to get it. So yeah, I like to do, um, you know, it, it changes with everything, but I like to do, uh, I have a great match pair of KM 85s that essentially are KM 84s, but with a low roll off. And so I use them on a lot of stuff. They still have a ton of low end, but they 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 scoop out a lot of rumble, and so I really like using it for acoustic guitars, for percussion, um, and so I use usually uh, a KM85 somewhere around the twelfth fret. But again, I, I'll move it. It's mostly that's a place to start, but I'll move it according to what I hear, uh, and then further back, either a C12 or a um, uh, what did I just use? I have one of those vintage blue bottles, uh, the nineties ones that were still made by hand. Um, and so that has a, I think it's the B four maybe is their Omni, um, capsule. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, some, you know, somewhere around that same spot, but a little higher, more on the wood rather than the fretboard, uh, more in the body of the guitar. Uh, and so I like that. I'll usually run a DI too, especially if it's going to go in a, you know, with electric guitars, um, I'd like to use either again the Evil Twin, which sounds phenomenal, or I have one of those A Design Ready, you know, those big, big mm -hmm. tube oh, uh, yeah, DIs. Yeah. The, I, or, yeah. I didn't know whether it was called the Ready or the Red DI. <laughs> yeah, I think that's why it's called the Ready because it is the Red DI. But yeah, it's the yeah. Ready. Um, they also A Design also they make a lot of cool stuff, and I have some of their stuff. But that 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 preamp is really nice, and specifically, it's really nice with acoustics. It just has a thing. Great with bass it, it has too, a, right? Great with bass. Great with bass. I'm just I'm so partial to my the Evil Twin that it's hard for me to convert. <laughs> um, but again, not being comfortable with almost every session, I'll give the Ready a uh, try. Um, you know, even if I'm going to end up going with the Evil Twin, I'd like to at least for specific songs hear what that would sound like. Um, but I really like the 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 Ready on acoustic and like and then it's a great thing to you know run the DI to like a, like the IBP or whatever, do it later in the, you know, in post, but, but really get the phase mask. But if you do it before, then you can actually hear what they're all doing together, which again, was why I don't like post because you're essentially guessing that this would work later. And that's, right. I, I just don't like that. Yeah. I, no, don't like that. I love it when I can get sounds that are exciting when you yeah, get the sound. Absolutely. And it inspires the player to play better. So yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So let's jump to drums for a sec. Uh, share a trick for recording great drums. What would you like to say about capturing great sounding drums mm. and, and maybe particularly for people who have home studios? What, what advice right. do you have for them? Well, my main advice is get a great drummer <laughs> Yeah, good advice. and, and, uh, and have a great drum kit because again, um, you know, people are so used to replacing stuff that the, the, dr the drum recording is almost just a template. Um, Definitely have a great drum kit. Definitely learn how to tune. If you're if you're doing everything on your own, learn how to tune the drums. Uh, uh, new heads don't mean great sounding heads. Sometimes old heads are great sounding. It's the same with bass strings. Yeah. Um, so learn how to tune the drums. There are so many uh, drum tuning videos on YouTube of of you know people who are real experts who've been doing this for a living for three decades, four decades. Um, I highly recommend checking it out. H having an understanding of of uh, you know how certain heads interact. Like at this point, I have probably three, four different complete sets of heads in my studio because different things just sound different, uh, even on different days. It doesn't even need a different genre. It could be a different day, different weather, and things just sound better. So mostly, you know, a great, great drum kit and a great drummer. And it doesn't have to be uh, an expensive drum kit. I have two main drum kits in the studio. I have a '70s Gretsch. 
um, that I bought from my friend Dave Illich, who's an incredible drummer. He played with the Mars Volta, and um, mm. he's just a great drummer. And and I I, I probably paid maybe twelve hundred dollars for that kit, and it's it's my people rent that kit for me sometimes because it's so incredible. It's a thunderous kit. It's great for pop and soul and 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 rock, and it's just a great kit. But then I have this crazy, um, you know, it's probably eight thousand dollar Craviato system, um, a uh, drum kit that is very. It's amazing, you know, but I don't use it all the time. I use the Gretsch almost all the time. So people don't need to hang, get hung up on on money. Uh, you know, you can buy great kits out there used on Craigslist or Reverb or whatever, how, you know. How do we identify a great kit if we don't have one already and maybe don't have a lot it, of experience with that? It, it, so go, that's what I do. So even though I'm a guitar player, I don't, because I've been using session guys for so long, I rarely play. And so I, I don't like to rely on myself for knowing what a great guitar is. I mean, I know in the studio what a great guitar is, but if it's just, you know, playing it like acoustically or just plug it into an amp, I can be like, okay, that's great sounding to me. And then a guitar player would be like, oh, well, it's this. So I have, you know, great friends uh, who are players who I'll take with me. I'll go, I have a, you know, great friend of mine who's a drummer that I'll take with me on, you know, if I'm like, oh, I need a couple snares for this record, I'll take a drummer with me and go audition some snares or I'll do the same with guitars. I never go buy things blind. I just recently bought a, um, a 72 Rickenbacker bass. Um, and you know, so I took my friend with me to, um, to ch check it out. Just, uh, you know, I'm not a jack of all trades, but but I like I said, I play musician. That's my instrument. So I so use your resources. Grab a a, a drummer friend that you trust um, that has good taste in drums, and go you know go audition some stuff. And it, you know, and there's no pressure, and you don't have to. It doesn't have to be the first kit that you see is the one you buy. Go you know check some stuff out. It's not a car buying transaction. If you come back a third time to check out the drum set, they're not going to charge you more. It's Craigslist. You know, it's it's yeah. Yeah, so just it's not it's not a game. It's again, it's all in the name of art. So if this drum kit will make you play better or will make you record better and and give someone else a great drum track for their song, it, you know, it's worth taking the extra steps. Go, you know, grab a friend and go audition some drums and um and, and check it out and this is same advice for for guitars and for bass and for um re, you know, really for anything keyboards. I have friends come out with me um, you know, to uh, actually when I was looking for a Wurlitzer Five six years ago, um, this really really great uh, keyboard player Josh Velo, he's out in New York. He actually also is a record producer and he has a great studio in Brooklyn. He uh, he was out here and he went with me. <laughs> we went on countless random strange Craigslist uh, dates <laughs> and auditioned different Wurlitzers because I don't I'm not a keyboard player. I know what I like in the studio, how a Wurlitzer should sound in the studio, but I don't know what the player experiences when they play right the keys, the action that they want, the when it distorts, how the tremolo, you know, all that stuff. And so I just you know, so so be nice to your friends because they won't go with you on too many of those weird uh, dates if you <laughs> if you're not nice to them. Yeah. That's great, man. Yeah. All right. So so let's assume we've got a great drummer, we got a great drum kit in the studio. What advice do you have for a simple miking to um, you know, a good place to start for yeah, recording drums? I'm I'm a huge, huge fan of the Glenn Johns technique, uh, which essentially is is um you know, two overheads, uh one hanging straight, you know, pointing straight down on exactly where the kick and the snare meet. And then the other one is on the floor tom side. And, you know, you guys can go online and look up Glenn Johns. And there's actually a nice video of Glenn himself uh, explaining it in some, some British studio. Yeah. Um, but um, it, it's, it's a great technique. The, the key to it, and he mentions it in, this, in the studio, but the key to it is to way over crank the preamps. That's, and it's not about distortion. You're not, if you're getting distortion in the overheads, unless that's a treatment you're looking for, you sh that you're doing it wrong or you're, you know, back, back up the preamps. But it's about you know, finding the sweet spot and then going one click up from that. Um, it, the way it opens the microphones it, that's the Glenn John sound. It's it's the placement is is key, but it's the 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 there's just a sound when you when you click a preamp one up from where it's comfortable and it just opens up. It's almost like there's a room mic open in the room, uh, mm -hmm. and, and it's some it's it's a capacitance thing. You know, it's a, it's a it's a it's an electric it's an electric interaction between the microphone and the preamp, and that's really key um, to that. So you know, from there I'll throw um usually a 47 fed in front of the kick, but really I know it's an expensive microphone. People can 
there are a lot of great microphones that people can just throw in front, you know, an RE20 or um, even a 421 sometimes does a great trick. Um, usually in inside the kick, I have um, a, like a 60s D12E that I really love, mm. but also um, I never remember the name of this mic, but there's a Sennheiser, I feel like it's like an E602 or something. Um, it's like a, it used to be a live sound kick mic, and I'm a huge, for modern records, I'm a huge fan of that mic inside the kick. It has a ton of definition. Uh, it has a lot of low end. It's not clicky. Uh, again, if your kick sounds great, uh, then it's not clicky. It's really good. So I'll do that with a 47 fed outside. Um, uh, 421 inside sometimes is nice. So you could do a 421 inside and like, you know, something outside like an 87 or a, 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 People can get creative. It's not people are obsessed. Well, sure, you have a forty-seven FET. You know, I don't have five grand to spend on a mic, but it's not always about the money. It's more about moving stuff around. But essentially, that's the 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 two Glenn Johns overheads and one kick mic. Essentially, gives you the whole image, and then you can that's you know cool. start throwing a, a you know a fifty-seven on the snare and uh, and kind of see. And again, everything you're adding, check phase, yeah. check phase, because with every mic you're adding, you're adding more detail on that specific drum. But then you're taking away detail from another drum that then is being delayed, recorded into that microphone. So, so I noticed that you conspicuously did not bring up the AKG D112 for the kick drum. Is that one I, that you you don't like so much, or you just don't tend to use it? I I don't like it at all. That's I don't great. like it at all. Um, <laughs> That's my yeah. mic of choice for kick drum. Uh, and but again, I, lo- it, I love hearing a, somebody else tell me that they don't like it. It's a flavor thing. Uh, I've I've owned it for years, mostly because you know when I was starting out, it was the only one I could afford. And like right. you said, it's this it's kind of the staple. So go for it. Um, but I I just don't like it at all. I feel like um, you know, just like with a lot of reissues. Sometimes they miss the mark. They try to improve upon a, a classic, and the things that they quote unquote improve on take away from what made the classic a classic. Right. Which was the was it the D twelve and then the D twenty five is the one you have? Uh, no, I have, have a D twelve. Yeah, I have a D twelve. Um, no, I have a D twenty five. That's a different. That's an American microphone company. That's a weird Omni mic that I have. Um, that's kind of a crazy mic, but I use that for other things. Nice. Yeah. All right, well, yeah. so let's see. Um, so we're getting some great drums. Let's talk about mixing a little bit, and then we'll kind of yeah. close out here. Yeah. Share a trick for, um, or some advice for getting a mix out loud without overdoing it, because we all have this tendency to overcook it as we try and make our mixes yeah. sound competitive. I, well, <laughs> I don't. I, I really don't. Um, in fact, before Mastering Grant's record, I sent a, a quick mix to the mastering guy that was going to m- master it, and said, "Hey, could I get get away with ke- uh, having it even lower? <laughs> like, yes. I wanted to. I, 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 I really want to. I always keep the 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 highest quality. And uh, I work so hard on dynamics and in a in recording the record and then b in mixing it that I don't really care about getting that extra two dB of of crush in the end. You know, mm-hmm. I, I put a." I put an SSL compressor on the mix. I really like that. It does give the glue thing. And, you know, I get 3, 4 dB of, of gain reduction. But I don't like to go more than that. And even with that, sometimes on songs that I feel like are a little more delicate, I'll I'll, I'll dial back the threshold so it's it's doing a little less. 2 to 3 uh, is good sometimes. And just, again, you can make it appear loud by mixing dynamically. Like You remember before you said when everything is loud, the only way to, to go dynamic is to go down. It's the same thing. Have things build up and then back down and then build up and then back down. And that gives you the perception of, of excitement without just over tiring, uh, the listener. Yeah. Okay, cool. I like that advice. And, um, you know, listening to your records that I found on YouTube and in the SoundCloud link that I'll include, um, they all sound plenty loud to me. So if you're not if you're not trying to overcook them and they already sound that way, then that's some pretty good advice. Well, I mean, they're all you know they're all mastered, so that's a thing. But but the the f- couple the few mastering guys that I like to send to, they know that I'm very picky and I essentially don't even want to hear a difference when I you know once I match the faders, I, and I kind of go back and forth between the master and, and the non master. I, I don't really want to hear a difference. I, I put so much care and attention into my mixes 
that I don't need the the master to have a ton of like sheen on it. Like right. whatever sheen I put on it in the mix is what I want it, you know, on it. So and same, I don't need it to all of a sudden come back subby. Like I don't really care about that. I've if I've wanted it subby, I'd put that in the mix. So uh, they're probably loud because of mastering. But I also don't know. Maybe I know YouTube. I think has some like loudness codec. I'm not sure about sure, um, sure. about SoundCloud. But yeah, those things terrify me. Well, and I just you know I think it's a comment too on how you're kind of hitting the mark so even if they are right. doing something to it that's right it's appropriate the way it all adds up right um cool man oh, i had another thought but i forgot what it was <laughs> uh, i think um i'll ask you a couple more questions and we'll, we'll close out here um we've got our usual jam session questions let's talk about um a couple of the aspects of that um oh you wanted to talk about interns Let's talk about I did, that. I did want to. I think it's one of the most important things uh, in in record making today because um, interns. You know, I started as as an intern and grew into an, uh, an an assistant engineer, a second engineer, a staff engineer, and then a freelance engineer. And so, everything I got as an intern, uh, you know, became my foundation for how I make records today. And really, there's not one thing that that I change. Uh, when I was starting out, uh, the the runner programs in big studios, I started at Record Plant, but a lot of those major studios, the runner program was a boot camp, essentially. I mean, you had no rights, you had all responsibilities, and uh, but it forced you to be really present because you didn't want to mess up. And so it forced you to re be, be really present. Um, and I think presence is one of the things that I miss in interns these days. The, the phone is a huge thing. I don't allow phones in my control room. Mm, um, cool. uh, it, it's a, it's really a huge distraction. Uh, you know, uh, many times I've, you know, I'll call an intern and it takes me, I need to call a second time cause they're on the phone. Um, I, I, I highly recommend to interns to have a little notepad and a pen. So when, when the engineer producer gives you notes, you don't have to whip out your phone um, because when you whip out your phone, then even if you're good and you're not on your phone, when you whip out your phone, then you see that you've missed a bunch of messages and about, and then, and then yes. that your mind is on that. Just have, a, have a pad and, and pencil or a pen and, and write that stuff down, whether it's a food order, a setup, um, uh, or, you know, or a tear down, this is really, really important. And, and my main note to interns is treat everything as if and not as if, uh, I mean, it does, it applies to record making. People think, and that's, uh, you know, back at Record Plant, you could really see the the parallels between getting a food order wrong and then messing up on a record or, uh, you know, not breaking down correctly or how it, that would um, affect negatively, uh, you know, the vocal session the next day, which then you, you can't, re you know, if you put a singer in a weird position, you might lose a whole day of recording. You might lose a couple of days of recording. So, Everything you do, the Mr. Miyagi thing, the wax on, wax off thing, applies <laughs> fully to the recording studio. If you're taking a food order, if you're cleaning, uh, if you are reorganizing uh, the mic stands in the live room, if you're setting up or breaking down, this all applies to the end product. Uh, it affects it severely, sometimes in positive ways, sometimes negative. So be present and be conscious of what you're doing. Um, because if you're, if, if the assistant, the intern is not present, it, it will negatively affect the end product. And, and I, I can't stress this enough that a take pride in your work. And, and secondly, know that everything, everything you do will affect the record. You know, some people are like what, it's just a food order. No, it's not just a food order. It, it's a specific wish that someone had that then affected their performance. You know, if they're thinking of, man, I wanted that dressing on my side. I know it sounds really petty, but having come from that place of, 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 of having it whipped into me, the, the, the importance of getting an order right and how that also then applies to when you're a mixer and you get a note from a, from the artist and you only missed one of 10 notes, that's still a huge miss. You know, yeah, you, you, yeah. so it's the same, it's the same exact thing. Um, if I send, uh, you know, my intern, to my tech to f get something fixed and he comes back and he's missing one thing. I mean, that could render the session, uh, uh, uh dead for that day. And so those are huge, and especially with LA traffic, you know, if you're then going back and I'll just send the artist home and say, I'm really, really sorry. And it, it reflects on me. So, you know, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And, and a lot of times the, the intern will be the weakest link. And I'd, I'd like to, you know, mend that before it even starts. So, um, that's really, really important to, to treat every little thing, whether you're vacuuming, uh, 
uh, or, or just like I tell my interns always, when you come in the morning, walk into the studio as if it's your studio and look around and see every little detail that you think could be improved upon, whether it's the, you know, the magazines in the lounge, uh, if the coffee machine, maybe the espresso machine is not on, or maybe it's on, but there's no water in it. It's there's, they're tiny things, but they're cumulative and, uh, and they add up to just having a great recording experience. Well, that's cool. And, um, rock stars will include a link in the show notes. As I was saying, um, actually I'm going to, the name of the link will be rsrockstars.com slash intern checklist. So Lior is going to share with me a, a real go-to checklist for stuff that you want to know about if you're going to be an intern. But I think it's also helpful if you are a studio owner and you're thinking about Definitely. having interns. Definitely. So we'll put together a great resource uh, PDF for you and consider it your psych yourself up for a day of internship or psych yourself up to have interns. Cause I know yeah. both of those are things that people want. And, um, sometimes the studio owners, I've heard people describe the frustration of working with interns cause it hasn't worked out in the past. And so we want to empower you with the ability to have it work out in the future. Absolutely. And it's a great tool, you know, interns essentially, uh, a lot, well, a lot of interns look at themselves as, as free work and, and, and kind of desperate, uh, if you find the studio or the producer that you want, or the mixer that you want to intern for, do everything you can to to get that get that job and keep that job because that's the only way to work. With all due respect, I know Full Sail is a fantastic school, and LA whatever it's called, film school or recording school is a great school. But all they do is they give you lingo to then go and get an intern job. Uh, and so the only way you'll learn the real stuff is by observing it done day to day on real records. Um, and, 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 and it's a, it's invaluable and priceless tool. So it's worth, you know, the, the, the $150,000 or hundred thousand dollars that schools charge these jobs, you know, people are like, Oh, I don't get paid. Well, you're getting a hundred thousand dollars worth of education. Um, and, and, and it's really important. Again, if you're on your phone the whole time, you're not learning anything and definitely just go to Starbucks or go anywhere else where you will get minimum wage. But if you care about, learning and acquiring tools to then become a producer, mixer, engineer, you know, whatever it is your interest, uh, your interests are, um, uh, pay attention and get a job at a studio that works on real records. That's great. Um, awesome. Well, we're kind of hitting our time limit here. So Leo, I'm going to jump to the final question that I yep. like to ask on the show and we're going to, it's hypothetical, but we're going to take the way back studio machine and, you're going to go back and find young Lior, yeah. probably early 90s or something like that. <laughs> Very young. Yeah, and tap yourself and on the shoulder. You turn around and say, what are you doing here? You say, well, I've come to give you this one bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know um, to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. So what would you? What advice would you go back and give yourself if you could? Um, mostly I'd say um, don't wait till you have everything perfectly in place to, to start, you know, making records and recording. Like I said, people get obsessed with gear or with money. Um, you know, uh, a, a, a small toolkit with some 57, some cables, you know, some decent preamps. Now the, the, there's so much cool stuff out there that's affordable. Just go and start making stuff because you will make mistakes. You will make some cool mistakes that will actually become a part of your sound. Uh, uh, so go and start doing it. Don't wait till you have your Fairchilds and your EMIs and your Neves and your, you know, Burl converter. Just just grab a laptop and, uh, you know, an Apollo and some some 57s and go do stuff. That's the only way to really see what works, what doesn't work, how to, you know, interact with people. And then that's my, my second part of this advice is don't discount the people part of, of making records. You know, always be nice and courteous to people, whether they're artists or they're interns or they're people that the interns interact with. I, it's a huge thing for me. I always tell my interns, when you go pick up food or coffee, be nice to the people, acknowledge them. If they have a name tag, say, hey, thanks, you know, George, or thanks, Mark. People having their names acknowledged is a huge thing. Um, so, so just, you know, always remember to be a human being. Uh, and it's more important than any kind of, uh, um, you know, coolness factor of, of a session, like looking cool. If, if you're a good person and you... Um, you know, share this goodness with other people, great things will come to you. So that's good advice, yeah. man. I like to hear that your philosophy for making records is essentially to make the world a better place. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, cool. Well, Lior, thank you so much for being on thank Recording you Studio for Rockstars me. with us, man. What a pleasure yeah, to hang out with you. That was fun. 
hear all this advice. Uh, let the rock stars know how they can find you online and and uh, learn more about you. Yeah, um, uh, my website is uh, www.leorgoldenberg.com. Dot com, which is my name, L-I-O-R is my first name, and G-O-L-D-E-N-B-E-R-G is my last name. Uh, so yeah, that's my website. I'm pretty sure um, <laughs> this started a record plant, but my my username for pretty much everything, emails and forums and all that stuff is P-Q-L-I-O-R, which stands for peculiar. Um, someone <laughs> someone put that on me on my water bottle at record plant and it's stuck. So like pretty much all my usernames are all peculiar. So it's P-Q-L-I-O-R. So I think that's my Instagram, my Facebook, um, yeah, whatever cool. other social stuff out there is, is that user. So yeah. Well, and then of course I'll include um, in the show notes, I'll include links to some of your YouTube uh, videos awesome. so that we can hear these examples of your records. And like I said, you've got a great playlist on SoundCloud. So we'll put that cool. in there too. And then just a last reminder, rock stars, go get Lior's intern checklist. So rsrockstars.com slash intern checklist. And I'll, I'll have a link in there. You can just click on it in the show notes and we'll put together a really nice PDF to both explain some really important points for you if you're thinking about interning or if you're a studio and you're thinking about having interns. I will also include in that my strategy for how to grow an intern base here at my studio really effectively. So we'll try and make something cool for you there. Thanks again for joining us, Lior. Um, it was great to meet Thank you, you at you, AAS New York. And I look forward to coming out to LA and seeing you in your studio. Sometime. Oh, for sure. Anytime. Let me know. You're, you're more than invited here. Yeah. All right, man. Cheers. Yeah. Thanks so much. All right. Have a great one. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.